Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be doing a video entitled In Defense of Abortion. Now, abortion rights are a politically and ethically contentious topic, but one that has deep implications for philosophy, metaphysics, justice, and morality. In this video, we will briefly summarize several arguments in defense of the legal right for women to get an abortion, even if it likely will mean this video will be demonetized. Let's take a look. So, to do this, we will use a common argument in favor of abortion restrictions, i.e. a pro-life argument. Each of the three views we examine here objects to a different one of the central premises of this argument. The most advocates of abortion rights object to more than one of these premises. While not all arguments in favor of abortion restrictions provide this exact argument, they all generally rely on some versions of these three premises. So let's take a look at the argument, and then we'll look at each of the camps that objects to one or more of these premises. So, first off, premise one, fetuses have moral status. We'll talk about exactly what moral status means in a minute. Premise two, if fetuses have moral status, then abortion is immoral in some or all cases. And we'll talk about those that think it's just some versus all cases when we get to that premise. And finally, if abortion is immoral, legal bans on abortion are a moral imperative. Then, via just a couple modus ponenses, we get we should therefore legally ban abortion, or at least legal bans on abortion are a moral imperative. This argument is broadly valid, and so the question is, is it sound? And we'll look at objections to each of premise one, premise two, and premise three. So, let's take a look. The most common objection to this argument attacks premise one, that fetuses have moral status. Having moral status means that something's interests matter for its own sake. For example, few would argue that a liver has moral status. I care about my liver, and might say you were immoral if you stabbed my liver. But its status is derived from its relationship to me, and the fact that I have moral status, not the fact that livers have moral status on their own. If I needed my liver removed and destroyed, perhaps because it was sick, no one would pick at the hospital, despite my liver being made of human DNA, having a pulse, being alive, etc. Most people claim that a baby, once born, does have moral status, and few people claim that eggs and sperm, separate and on their own, have moral status. The question then is at what point does this thing gain moral status? Is it at the moment of conception? Is it at viability? Is it at birth? Or is it sometime later when it gains consciousness? There is clear, broad disagreement on when things gain moral status, and no solid way to settle it. Also tied up in this question is the question of identity and parthood. What makes something not part of you? Is your blood part of you? Most would say yes. What about bacteria in your gut? Mitochondria in your cells that used to be their own organisms many eons ago, but are now part of your cells? What about a mutated tumor inside you with different DNA? Is that part of you? Are your eggs and sperm part of you? They seem to have different DNA too. At what point in pregnancy does a fetus become something different from you? It seems that most things inside your body are a part of you. Why is a fetus not? No one would think you have a moral responsibility to not kill bacteria in your gut or a parasite in your stomach, because in some way they are inside you, and you have a certain level of autonomy over your own body. So, with those in mind, let's look at this first premise of fetuses have moral status. Based on these considerations, we might craft several objections to premise one. First, one might argue that Independent moral status requires a number of features that a fetus does not possess. One might say that it requires physical separation from another. If you are wholly inside and reliant on another, you can't have moral status. It might require capacity for rational thought, and fetuses don't have the capacity for rational thought. It might require the ability to independently obtain rationality without something else, i.e. setting the line at viability. If a fetus could be taken out of the womb and be viable, then it has moral status. But if it doesn't have that ability to independently obtain rational thought, independence, what have you, then 
it doesn't have moral status. Or maybe it's consciousness that we care about, or the ability to obtain consciousness, certain specific cognitive capabilities, etc. Now, there are issues with many of these lines that are drawn around moral status, but you need to draw the line somewhere. And many of the lines that are drawn exclude fetuses at some point in development. There's disagreement on exactly what the conditions for moral status are, but few of them are satisfied by fetuses. Conversely, one might argue that fetuses lack moral status because they're not separate individuals. Your kidney is part of a system that has moral status, but one would not say that your kidney has moral status itself. Your eggs are part of you, but not a separate individual. Simply because they have human DNA and have the potential to become something separate if given the correct conditions doesn't mean that they are. One might think of a pollinated flower on a tree. It has the potential, if given the right conditions, to become a seed and eventually a separate tree itself. But it would seem wrong to call a pollinated flower a tree, or something separate from a tree, the tree it's currently attached to. If you think a pollinated flower is just part of a tree and not another tree itself, it's hard to see how you could think that a fertilized egg is a human or something independent of the person that carries it. Now, let's take a look at premise two. If fetuses have moral status, abortion is immoral in some or all cases. Some of the most famous thought experiments around the question of abortion target this second premise and are offered by the philosopher Judith Jarvis Thompson. They concede that even if fetuses have moral status, abortion would still be moral. These arguments make the case that even if someone were to be carrying a fully fledged adult that clearly has moral status, they would be more, a person would be morally justified in aborting them before viability. Some of these target specific cases and so are geared to certain situations, for example in the case of rape or in the case of when a mother's life is in danger. Now, the most famous of these thought experiments is called the violinist thought experiment. Imagine that you're kidnapped by a society of fans of a famous violinist who's very sick. They connect your kidneys up to this violinist while you're asleep, and when you wake, tell you that if you disconnect yourself, he will die. But if you stay connected for nine months, he will be saved and live a long, happy life. Are you morally justified in disconnecting yourself from the violinist? According to Thompson, the answer is yes. And this means that in cases of rape, even if fetuses are full-fledged persons, the mother is morally justified in getting an abortion. Thompson has other arguments objecting to other situations. The expanding baby thought experiment imagines a mother living in a house with an expanding baby that will crush her unless she kills it. Thompson argues that the mother would be justified in killing the baby to save her own life, arguing that abortion is justified in cases where the mother's life is in danger. The people seeds thought experiment makes the case that if you were taking all precautions to not get pregnant and you still get pregnant, you'd be justified in having an abortion, even if the fetus is a person. Check out our older videos on these thought experiments for more, where we dig more in depth into what the actual thought experiments are covering. Now, there are other objections that one might offer to this premise. One might claim that fetuses have only a lesser kind of moral status, which is insufficient to make abortion immoral. Perhaps fetuses have moral status equivalent to an animal, perhaps allowing that they not be made to suffer excessively, but can still be terminated. There are also might be a wide range of disagreement about what set of cases is allowed for any number of reasons. This is that all versus some. Some people might say, well, abortion might be immoral in some cases, but not all cases when you consider things like rape, incest, etc. Finally, though, let's take a look at premise three. It seems to me that this third premise is by far the weakest, as while the other two premises lack a strong convincing argument for them, there's no one widely accepted counterproposal. It's really unclear, honestly, where we should draw the lines of moral status and personhood, or where we should draw the lines in terms of autonomy and where you have autonomy over your own body versus someone else's body, particularly when that someone else is reliant on you. I do think those arguments are somewhat convincing, but I also think it's hard to draw a clear line in the sand. However, I do think premise three is much weaker because here we're going to face several objections that we'll look at here, that bans don't work, that other methods exist at preventing abortion, harm 
of bans outweighs the benefits, and, of course, an argument from skepticism. Let's take a look. So, first off, one objection to this premise is that bans do not work to stop abortions, only to make them less safe. All the advocates of abortion restrictions are doing is endangering women, not actually reducing abortions. Research by Human Rights Watch has shown that in countries where abortion is banned, the practice does not stop, it merely goes underground, making it more dangerous. The highest abortion rate in the world is in Latin American countries that have the strictest abortion bans. The only real outcome of abortion bans is that more women will die trying to get abortions. This is evidence that advocates of abortion restrictions either don't actually care about life, since their policies would kill more people than they save, only about controlling women, or that they're simply too ignorant to do the research on what policies would actually accomplish their goals of reducing abortions, because banning it doesn't work and simply controls and harms women. Now, this leads to the second objection. There are other policies than bans that actually reduce abortions. Access to contraceptives, comprehensive se sexual education, and subsidized health care all reduce abortions. However, the people that claim to be quote-unquote pro-life are those who are actively advocating against these very policies. Once again, it makes clear that the legal justification for banning abortion is not to stop abortions, but to control women's bodies, and therefore enforce theocratic norms on an unwilling population. Even if you think abortion is wrong, basic research can show you that banning it will not reduce its prevalence, but supporting women's health will. Abortions generally decrease during Democratic administrations and rise or stay the same during Republican administrations. You might think of it like prohibition. When alcohol was banned, it was still very prevalent. It was just much more dangerous because it was illegal and unregulated. This ban did not succeed at decreasing drinking, only undermining the rule of law, encouraging crime, leading to the rise of the mob, and making things less safe for everyone. Policies instead that tax alcohol, regulate it, and enact public awareness campaigns around the dangers of drunk driving or binge driving can be far more successful at reducing harm. If your goal is actually to reduce abortions, you would pursue policies that reduce them, not ban them. If your goal is to simply control women, then you would require them to become criminals in order to get health care. The third argument against a ban on abortion is that there are many greater harms that outweigh the benefits of banning abortion. Though as shown before, there are not really any benefits, benefits to banning abortion, since bans don't actually decrease abortions, but do actively increase harm. However, the harms of banning abortion are quite great. In places where abortions are banned, women who have normal miscarriages are often jailed for murder. Around a fifth of pregnancies result in miscarriage. If the average woman has two children in her life, it means that one in three women will be in danger of being jailed for murder for doing absolutely nothing wrong. Once again, this seems like a practice designed to control women, not prevent abortions. The final argument I'll offer here comes in the form of, from the position of skepticism. It seems like there are a gr is a great deal of disagreement around the first two claims. What makes someone a person and when autonomy can be restricted. Given this high degree of disagreement, I am not convinced that there is an objectively right answer, that there is some moment we can point to where separate life truly begins, or that there is some tipping point where one entity's rights outweigh another's. And public opinion seems to reflect this, with a majority of Americans supporting abortion in some cases, but vastly disagreeing on which cases. Based on the clear lack of consensus and ability to draw a line and potential lack of an objective answer at all, this seems like something that is completely immoral to legislate on. Individuals should be able to choose based on their own convictions about when life begins or who has bodily autonomy. This is not the kind of thing that should be legislated because there is a huge diversity of views and opinions and there is no clear objectively right course and no way to get to that objectively right course. Getting an abortion is a very hard decision, and it should be a personal one, not a government-mandated choice. However, hopefully this lays bare what is really going on here. Extremist religious groups who dogmatically think they have an answer to a question that may be impossible to answer are attempting to impose their beliefs on the rest of us, who are justifiably skeptical 
that there is a perfect right answer for every situation. The real crime here is blind dogma that makes individuals think they have a single right answer with any, when anyone that rationally reflects on the issue can see that the wiser course is to suspend judgment and therefore not legislate on an uncertain and unclear issue, but leave it up to personal choice. It would seem wild and crazy for a legislature to adopt a law around the idea of free will where there's broad philosophical disagreement or a law around the idea of choosing deontology over utilitarianism once again where there's broad philosophical disagreement when there is disagreement on matters of ethics and personal choice it makes sense to leave it up to personal choice as an atheist i'm also deeply worried about that such a restriction will set a precedent for religious people who believe that you are immoral if you don't do what they think is right, if you don't believe in God, if you're gay, to impose, further impose their view of the world on others and make disagreeing with them illegal. The point is, when there is disagreement on this, particularly between different religions, it does not make sense to legislate in favor of one religion and against another. I strongly encourage you to support candidates that vow to protect freedom and separation of church and state who do not pretend that religious freedom means freedom of a majority religion to impose its unjustified and bigoted dogma on everyone else. Whew. With that, a big thank you to Frederico Galveofor, apologies for mispronouncing that, uh, for supporting Carneades.org on Patreon since 2020. Apologies, Frederico Galveo for supporting Carneades.org on Patreon since 2020. You too can support the channel and get access to Patreon exclusive posts for just $2 a month, less than the price of buying me a cup of coffee. If you want to support public philosophy, please do consider donating. What do you think? Do fetuses have moral status? If so, can that moral status override the moral status of a mother? And if so, is a ban the best way to avoid abortions? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Subscribe if you like this video and you want to see more. Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org and stay skeptical, everybody.